Welcome back everyone to another NASCAR Heat 5 setup video. Today's video takes us to the desert for yet another of NASCAR's shorter tracks in Phoenix Raceway. Now this track is a lot of fun to drive but it's extremely easy to overdrive the car. Very easy to drive too deep into the corners, get back to the gas too quickly and all of that equates to being very hard on the tires. So we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, driving styles today. We'll touch on Cup as well as Xfinity and Trucks, but mostly this is all about the Cup cars. Before we get into the setup discussion, there's a few other pieces of information that I wanted to pass along. First, be sure to check out the video idea talking about NASCAR Heat 4 setups in NASCAR Heat 5. In the video, I talk about whether or not these Heat 4 setups work in Heat 5, and also my approach to setups in NASCAR Heat 5. Next, let's talk about tire wear settings. I generally work with normal settings, so normal wear and normal tire wear fall off. And the reason I do that is so that we can get a very good baseline, which is the most important thing for me to pass along to you guys. That way, if you're using more aggressive tire wear settings, more wear, less grip as the tires wear, then you'll know that you need to tighten the car up some in order to save the tires, uh, in particular, the right rear. If you're using less aggressive settings, which would be less tire wear, more grip in the tires as they wear, then you know that you can get by with running a little bit looser setup. So using normal settings for both tire wear as well as grip fall off allows me to create that baseline. I do enjoy using the other settings, particularly having the more aggressive settings and less grip as the fall off happens, but I think normal on both tire wear and fall off gives us a very good baseline. Also, the focus of my setups is on stability. I don't focus so much on a single lap speed or worry about single lap qualifying type speed. I'm more interested in the race and having a good car from the beginning of the run through the middle of the run and then finishing up the run strong as the fuel wears out. And then finally, when I'm doing setups for both uh, Cup, Xfinity, as well as the trucks, I like to keep these as close to each other as possible so that it gives the same feel across all three series. In general, Xfinity and trucks run a little bit tighter for me using the same setup as I would use in the cup cars. So in general, I'm going to loosen those up just a little bit in order to get the identical feel that I have with cup. So with that out of the way, let's move over into the setup. Just as with every track in NASCAR, driving style matters. But on a short track, it matters even more because you spend a lot of time working the throttle, working the brake, uh, as well as the steering wheel. There's a lot of different inputs going on. So it is very easy to overdrive the car. It is very easy to overdrive the entry, get the car either very loose or very tight. That's going to wear out the tires quicker. Same thing applies in the center of the corner. You get back to the gas too quickly. It's going to get the car jumping loose on you, or it's going to make the car really tight. All of those factors will ultimately determine the life of the tires. Now, for me personally at Phoenix, tire wear is really not an issue as far as getting down close to 0% and blowing a tire. However, how balanced your car is and at the end of a run, how balanced your tire wear is, is ultimately going to be determined by how you drive the car. I'm going to be showing you guys two different setups in the cup car, much as what I did with uh, Richmond a little bit earlier. The difference between Richmond and here is going to be that I'm not then going to go into the Xfinity cars and the trucks simply because those setups are so close to the cup setup or even identical in a lot of cases. It's just not worth going into here. Instead, we're going to talk about some of those adjustments that I would make in Xfinity or trucks along the way here in the cup car. So again, keep in mind that how you drive the car is going to matter a lot. And hopefully one of these two setups that I show you today will work out perfectly for the way you drive. The first setup we're going to take a look at in today's video is the more balanced of the two setups. And what I mean by balance in the NASCAR heat series is the tire wear, specifically the relationship of the right front and the right rear and how closely they wear to one another and to a lesser extent the left front and the left rear and how close they wear to one another. As long as the right front and the right rear wear to the point where by the end of the full fuel run they are within say two to four percent of each other that is a fairly well balanced 
setup with regards to tire wear. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the car drives well balanced. In the NASCAR Heat Series, the way the car drives is very disconnected to the way the tires wear, in my opinion. And so you have to separate the things. The car can either drive good or the tires can wear good, but you don't always get both together. So keep that in mind when you're driving the car and my definition of balanced and how that relates to the tire wear. So moving to the shock settings to begin. 15 and 10 across the board on all four corners of the car. As always, I'm definitely not saying that you need to keep it the, uh, the same identical shock settings on all four corners of the car. It's just meant to give you a starting point. In this case, I wanted to go a little stiffer here for some quicker transitions into and off the corners simply because that's the feel that I prefer. The higher the number you use on bump and or rebound, the quicker the response time is going to be from the shocks, the quicker the uh, transition will be in the corner. So as, as you go into the corner, uh, as well as when you get back on the throttle to leave the corner. So the higher numbers are going to give you quicker response, quicker transitions of the weight. Lower numbers, such as you've seen me use at some of the other tracks, such as 3 to 5, 3 to 6, or 7 range, will give you slower transitions. The car will be more sluggish and slower uh, to react. The car will want to roll a little bit more, all of those types of things. So it really just depends on the feel and the reaction you're looking for from the chassis. As always, uh, I definitely recommend testing each of the four corner and making changes there because that will really help you get a feel for what each corner of the car is doing, specifically with the shock package. But very bland on the release setup at 15 and 10 for a little bit stiffer feel. And you can certainly go even higher than the 15 or the 10 that I'm showing. Weight settings. Uh, maximum left side weight, which is, of course, what we want because we're on an oval. No reason to go with anything other than the max unless you are on a road course where you're turning left and right, in which case you would want to put this uh, at 50% or at least fairly close to it. Going to the nose weight or the front weight, 52%. Remember, the higher the nose weight, the more stable the car will be, uh, particularly on the entry, entry and through the center of the corner, but that also means it's tighter, uses the front tires a little bit more. So you want to use uh, basically the least amount of nose weight that you can get by with and still have the car to be stable for you. On the wedge, 53%. Max is 55%. The higher the wedge number, the more stable the car will be, the, the slower the car will want to rotate. So it's a, a very quick and easy way to tighten up the car. The lower the wedge number you use, the looser the car will be, the quicker it will want to rotate. So if you're uh, in a situation where you need the car to rotate more, it's just too tight overall, then drop the wedge number maybe by a half percent or a full percent and see if that helps you along. Moving on to the spring settings, uh, stiffer left front than right front once again, as we've seen uh, at Richmond as well. Using the maximum 1,200 pound left front spring really helps us to get the car to rotate on corner entry. You couple that with a right front spring that's a little bit softer at 1,100 pounds, then the car really wants to cut very nicely uh, on corner entry. So if the car is too loose on corner entry, one of your options is to flip-flop the front springs. Put that 1,100 in the left front, 1,200 in the right front, and that will tighten up your corner entry. So in general, the higher the number you use on the right front spring, the tighter the car is going to be overall, in particular, uh, on corner entry. Now, the left front spring is very helpful for corner entry. That's why we have the Max 1200 here to help with rotation on entry. But the lower the number, uh, the more it's going to tighten the car up on entry. So just some things to keep in mind. There's a lot of adjust adjustability that can be built in using the front springs. The rear, rear springs, 550 and 600 pounds, so only 50 pounds of rear spring split. But the most important factor to notice here is that the, the 600 pounds is the maximum right rear spring. In this case, I'm using the rear springs at their max or very near the max in order to help the car to rotate. The stiffer the rear springs overall, the more the car will want to rotate. The If you start reducing the left rear and the right rear spring together, let's say we reduce this to 400 pounds in the left rear, 450 in the right rear, that would tighten the car up quite a bit simply because you no longer have uh, as stiff as springs in the rear of the car. Also, another thing to think about is the split between the left rear 
and the right rear here, only 50 pounds. The more you increase that split, the looser the car will be when you get back to the throttle. And the less you make the split in the rear springs, the tighter the car will be when you get back to the throttle. So another very good adjustment to use as you are uh, testing and working with the car. Tire pressure settings, there's a lot of numbers I could have used here. These are the numbers I decided on finally, 13 and 14 on the lefts, 34 and 32 on the rights. Again, plenty of opportunity here. I went down as low as maybe 31 or 32 on the right front. Uh, and somewhere down around 30, maybe even 29 is as low as I got on the right rear. So again, you've got a ton of adjustability here. In general, I prefer to go a little bit on the underinflated side as opposed to overinflated. So whenever I'm given a choice, I prefer to run slightly under rather than overinflated. But again, tons of adjustability here and adjust these to where it feels better for you. Overall, the higher the tire pressures, the more straight line speed you will have, but a little bit less in the corner simply because the tires are going to be a little bit over inflated or maybe very over inflated depending on how much you raise those air pressure. So you lose a little bit of grip and sacrifice that for straight line speed, which could certainly come in handy on the bigger tracks, but not so much something that we're going to uh, worry about on a short track. Short track, it's all about grip and the lower numbers generally help out with that. Moving on now to the miscellaneous settings, plus three and minus three on the front camber. Uh, that's a pretty standard number for me simply because it just works for me. Uh, on some tracks, you can get by with a good bit more than the plus or minus three. You can get up as high as about four. Uh, plus or minus is about the highest number I've been able to get by with without sacrificing uh, tire life and tire durability. Getting much above four really starts to hurt the life of the tire, but you might be able to gain a little bit of extra uh, speed from it. So again, something to play around with, but plus or minus three seems to be a very good number for me to start with. Now moving on to the front sway bar. Here you see that we're using the maximum 2.0 front sway bar. That is the higher the number on the front sway bar, the more stable and the tighter overall the car will be. That is a very good feeling for me here at Phoenix because it keeps the car nice and stable when I'm trying to charge the corners, keeps me from getting uh, really uh, out of shape. It also allows me to use stiffer rear springs in order to allow the car to rotate. So across the board, just like we talked about with the shock settings, a stiffer feel, same thing with the rear springs, same thing over here with the front sway bar. It all works together. So really whenever you're designing a setup for a car, you're really working with a package. And that's why you hear them talk uh, in real life so much about the package that they bought to uh, that particular track because everything works together. If the 2.0 isn't working for you, if the car is just too tight, uh, especially on entry and just doesn't want to rotate for you, then drop this by one to two clicks. I really wouldn't adjust more than that. Uh, without making some other adjustments in other areas such as the springs and uh, wedge, front weight, that type of thing. Because lowering the front sway bar is going to loosen the car up, uh, take some of the stability away. So again, you just have to plan ahead when you're going to make changes like that. But bigger front bar, the tighter and more stable the car, reducing the front sway bar makes the car looser and takes some of the stability out of the car. Moving on now to uh, the track bar. So 11 inches on the left, 10 inches on the right. Slightly higher on the left than on the right, and that is simply because a higher number on the left side helps the rotation of the car on corner entry, which is where we need to maximize our speed, or at least I do at this particular track. Getting into the corner very well sets me up for success the remainder of the corner, and 11 inches allows me to get into the corner without getting too loose. Uh, if you find that you're getting too loose on corner entry, then one of your adjustments is to simply lower the left side track bar by maybe a quarter or a half inch, and that should tighten up your corner entry. Moving on to the right side of the track bar, this is more for corner exit. So if you find that the car is just too loose on corner exit, then drop the right side track bar and that will tighten the car. If the car is too tight on corner exit, then raise the right side track bar. Here, I've got it dropped a little bit below the left side track bar in order to save that right rear tire for a full run. We want to make sure we save that right rear tire and keep it with us uh, as long as we possibly can. Brake bias, very important at this track. I don't use 
uh, a lot of break. I simply like to use the brake uh, very smoothly on corner entry just to set the nose and get the car pointed in the right direction. You know, I don't need a huge percentage of brake pressure here, but just a smooth amount in order to control the rotation of the car and 75% works very well for me there. The higher the number on brake bias, the tighter the car is gonna be under braking. So again, if you're too loose on corner entry under braking, then increasing this number up closer to 80% or even more will certainly tighten up the car. On the flip side, dropping the brake bias to something like 72, 73, or even lower will free the car up under braking and can really help your rotation, particularly on corner entry. It's all in how you decide to use the brakes, how heavy you use them, how often you use them, and for how long you use them. Uh, some people like to use them just a little bit on the entry of the corner and then very quickly get off of them. Other people will more trail brake the car into the corner, try to drive in really deep and use uh, the brakes as a mean uh, to rotate the car. So again, it's all in how you use the brakes as to what that brake bias will really need to be for you. Grill tape, I didn't spend very much time at all here. 45% uh, is what I settled on. I believe you can get by a little bit more aggressive with that, maybe up to 50%. I doubt you can get by with 55, but I could be wrong. Again, not something I spend a lot of time with. Biggest thing here is you just don't want the engine to overheat, which happens as you get close to 260 uh, on the temperature. So stay away from that and you'll be just fine with the grill tape. Wheel lock and steering offset are at my defaults of 10 degrees on the wheel lock, 0.05 on the offset. Now the wheel lock is a great way to adjust the speed and the quickness of the steering at the track level without going into the options where you're actually setting up uh, all of the attributes of the wheel itself. The higher the number for the wheel lock up around 15, 17, 20 and so on, that's gonna be quicker steering for the car overall. Drop that number down to seven, eight, six, anything in that range, and you're gonna get much slower response, which means you're probably gonna to have to put more wheel in the car uh, when you go into the corners. Steering offset is really tied closely to the amount of camber that you're using. More camber in the front, more steering offset if you're interested in minimizing the amount of time you have to spend turning to the right on the straightaways. Everything in the car is built to turn left. So the car wants to go left, which means that on the straightaway, you're gonna have to turn to the right some in order to keep the, gar the car going straight. The steering offset is meant to offset some of that pull to the left. Just be careful about using too high of a number. You can actually introduce a pull to the right into the car, which is certainly not something that you want on an oval. Finally, moving into the gear settings as normal, I really didn't mess with first, second, or third, even though there's probably a few tweaks that I can make there, namely uh, second and third going down a couple of clicks there. Uh, third gear, I usually like to be closer to a 1.4, 1.45, somewhere in that range, but third gear of 1.6 worked well enough uh, for our setup, so I left it where it was by default. Rear end ratio at 4.0. I also tested out quite a bit with 4.11 in the rear, but with 4.11, I was on the rev limiter pretty hard uh, for most of the fuel run. So I decided to back off of that a little bit to a 4.0. Feel free to try even lower numbers at that, something like a 389. Uh, just depends on what you're looking for. Keep in mind the rear end ratio, the higher the number you use here, something like that uh, 411 or higher, that's gonna make the engine turn more RPMs and generally gonna make the car looser when you get back to the throttle. So it's just another way to adjust the handling of the car. The lower number, something like I was talking about with a 389 or even lower, that's gonna run fewer RPMs from the engine, which is generally gonna make the car a little bit tighter when you are on the throttle. So again, a lot of maneuverability here in the setup to change things around, to fit your driving style. That takes care of the first setup. Now let's move into setup number two. Here in the second setup, we're not gonna go through uh, segment by segment and talk about each of the settings. Instead, we're going to do a couple of things. First, we'll talk about the differences between this setup and the previous one. Also, we'll talk a little bit about the changes I make from Xfinity uh, and trucks compared to the cup car. Starting off with the shock settings, everything looks the same until you get to the right rear bump. Instead of using 15 here, I have it down to 10. Reason being, 
this setup is not as balanced. This setup is more about speed. Now it still works very well on a long run because once again, these videos are all about race setups. These are not qualifying setups. I would definitely want to loosen up the car a good bit more than it is now for a qualifying style setup. So this is still a very good race run setup. However, I wanted to make sure I took care of the right rear tire as best I can and dropping the right rear bump helps me to do that just a little bit along with some other things that we're going to see next. So then we move into the weight settings and here you notice that the front weight is at 53.5, definitely higher than what we saw in the previous one. Why is that? Well, if we come over to the front sway bar, here we're using 1.315 as opposed to a 2.0. And as I mentioned earlier in the video when talking about the previous setup, the higher the number you use on the front sway bar, the tighter and more stable the car will be. The lower the number, which is what we're looking at here, is going to loosen the car up. And this front sway bar setting is a good bit lower than the 2.0 that we were looking at earlier. So I needed to find ways to tighten up the car. Reducing that front sway bar definitely helped the car to rotate, so I need to compensate and tighten up some other areas of the car and that's where the front weight setting needed to increase i needed to add some stability i needed to tighten up the car this is one way to do it moving on to the spring settings you notice in the rear of the car these springs are a good bit lower than what we saw in the previous setup again another way of tightening the car as well as the split in the rear springs only 30 pounds of rear spring split that is also going to tighten up the car. So we've already seen three ways, uh, make that four ways, counting the shock setting, that we're going to tighten up the car just to offset the amount of uh, turn we've introduced into the car with that reduced front sway bar. Also, tire settings a little bit different, uh, particularly on the right side. Left side are the same, but right sides a couple of pounds less on both the right front and the right rear. Just a little different feel to it. This is definitely underinflated. Uh, but it has a very nice feel to it as far as I'm concerned. So something to play around with on the tire pressure side of things. So then we already talked about uh, the front sway bar. But the biggest thing I wanted to do with this setup is give you something to compare and contrast with. Take a look at the first setup in today's video. Take a look at this setup and compare. What is it that's the same? What is it that is different between the two? And that'll give you a little bit of an idea of how I start to build setups and what I look for once I get a feel that I really like. Moving on down to the gears, you'll notice those are exactly the same as what we saw previously. Now let's talk a little bit about Xfinity and the trucks. I've mentioned in pretty much every video that the Xfinity as well as the trucks are a little bit tighter overall for me than the cup cars. It's not really that much in the setups that I've been using so far uh, here in NASCAR Heat 5, but in general, those cars like to run a little bit tighter for me, so I generally loosen them up just a little bit. In terms of this setup, uh, and really overall, the first thing I like to go to is the wedge number. It's a very easy adjustment to help the car rotate more overall. So for Xfinity and truck, the first thing I would do is drop this down to about 52.5, and if the car was still a little bit tight, I would drop it down to 52.0 and that will usually get me very close to where I want to be in either Xfinity or the trucks. Now for example let's say that that didn't quite work out, it didn't give me exactly what I was looking for, I would come back to the rear springs and I would add anywhere from uh, 20 to 50 pounds of rear spring in each of the rear springs. Try to keep the split the same if at all possible and if I'm going to increase the split I might only do it up to a max of about 50 pounds overall. So here what I might want to do is go up to something like 500 and 550. That's going to give me more rear spring overall which is going to help the car rotate and also I'm increasing the amount of split in the rear springs which is going to help the car rotate even more on corner exit. So that gives me two very quick ways that I can go from a cup setup to an Xfinity or from cup to truck without having to make wholesale changes to the car. So that's going to do it for today. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and hopefully one of these two setups is going to help put you on the right path based on your driving style. So thank you very much for joining me and stay tuned for more NASCAR Heat 5.